So, okay, welcome everybody to the, um, I think it's about the last session of the day here. My name is Dirk Balfans. I'm a member of the security team at Google where I work on um, authentication, user authentication uh, issues. Things like two-factor authentication, OpenID, OAuth, things like that. Uh, the title of the session is Client Login Fail. Uh, there's a URL down here on the slide where you can leave real-time feedback for the session. Uh, it's goo.gl2qxxx. And the hashtags for this track uh, are Google APIs in addition to the IO 2011. So what we're going to talk about in this session are installed applications, and in particular, what you need to do when you need to authenticate to Google APIs from an installed application. Traditionally, the API you use to obtain authentication tokens for an installed application is, uh, is called client login. But I'm going to explain why client login is actually not a good choice for your users. I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about application-specific passwords, which are sort of a stopgap for applications that can't move away from client login. But most of the time, I'm going to talk about OAuth, OAuth 2 in particular, and how it can be used for installed applications. And I expect to be talking about 45 minutes or so, leaving time for questions at the end. So, excuse me. So, what are installed applications? Installed applications are anything that the user downloads on their machine, uh, installs, and that are not bound by the rules of the web. There is no same origin policy that this application needs to abide by. Um, they have access to a whole bunch of um, platform APIs that you couldn't access otherwise from a, from a web application, for example. So if you have a video editor that uploads videos to YouTube, that's an installed application. Uh, if you have a photo viewer that um, can access your Picasa web albums, that's an installed application. Your IMAP clients, your Thunderbirds, your Mac mails, your uh, talk clients, and so forth. Those are all installed applications. And the ones that we're interested in here are the ones that need to authenticate to Google APIs. Your iPhone apps, your Android apps, those are installed applications, the, the, the native apps that you get from the Android market and uh, the... Um, the App Store, I guess it's called. Um, and you guys as developers, you probably deal with you know, just your command line tools that sometimes also need to uh, authenticate to Google APIs. For example, the App Engine uh, config tool that you use. And there's a bunch of screenshots of a variety of installed applications on the, on the slide. So I mentioned today that, I mentioned previously that today what installed applications often do is when they need to authenticate to a Google API, they use this. Um, endpoint that we have called client login to exchange basically a username and password for an auth token. And then you take the auth token and you take it to your application, uh, your API endpoint, and that's how you authenticate to the, to the API endpoint. The user experience looks something like this. The uh, application draws some window on the screen and says, hey, user, what is your username? What is your password? User enters the username and password, and then the app takes that to the client login endpoint. Um, whenever I have a little demo thing on the slide. I'm going to try and show you how this works. Don't let me go through a slide without, that has one of the demo things on there without actually doing it. I might forget. Um, so uh, I have a little cheat sheet here also. You do not want to have to wait for me typing, trust me. Um, so hitting the client login endpoint is really pretty easy. All you need is curl, basically. Um, so it's on, on google.com slash account slash client login. You give it an email, you give it your password, and you say which uh, service you want to access. In this case, CP is the uh, address book, the contacts API. And that returns a bunch of auth tokens. The one that's interesting here is the third one here, down here. Uh, let me extract that. And so now you have the auth token that you can use to access uh, an API. So again, curl is really all you need here for this. Um, you put the auth token in an authorization header. It says Google login auth equals token, and then we hit the endpoint for the, for the context API. And you get back a whole bunch of JSON. Let me see if I can clean up the JSON with a little um, function here that just sort of filters stuff out. Um, sorry. Okay. Let me 
we fetch the JSON here? Is it in there? Yep. And um, so this is the name, so it's just a little function that filters, goes to the JSON result. So this is the complete address book of this example user that I started off with. There's only two people in there. Okay, so that's how client login works. But sometimes it doesn't. There's a bunch of different use cases in which client login stops working. Here's one of them, captchas. Sometimes the Google login system decides to throw a captcha uh, at the user after they log in. Maybe because the, the login looked suspicious, uh, we're suspecting this, that this might be a bot that has maybe stolen the password and is not the real user. And to try to distinguish uh, bots from users, we uh, throw up captchas. And there's actually a provision in the client login protocol to deal with captchas. The server could signal that a captcha um, so solution by the user is needed. But many installed applications either don't implement that part of the protocol or maybe implement it incorrectly. And as a result, what you have, have is that a user that if they were to log in through the web, they would log in, they would see the captcha, they would solve the captcha, and they would be on their merry way. If they use one of those applications that maybe doesn't implement the capture part quite right, um, they're actually stuck and they can't use that application. Another application is two-step verification, our two-factor auth uh, solution that we launched a couple months ago. And while I said there was a provisional protocol for captchas, there's actually no programmatic equivalent for two-step verification. So if you're logging into Google on the web side, you would type username and password, and then you would see as the next page, a page that asks you for your one-time password. And you would enter that, and then you would be logged into your application or into Google in general. There's no equivalent of this on the programmatic side, on the client login endpoint. So users that have signed up for two-step verification cannot use client login. It doesn't work for them. Here's another example, OpenID. Google is a relying party to, at this point, uh, Yahoo, Hotmail, and AOL. So users that have usernames that are at yahoo.com, at hotmail.com, and so forth, can choose to turn on OpenID. And what happens when one of those users goes to the Google login page, they actually get redirected to Yahoo, for example. And that's where they type in their password. Yahoo becomes, becomes what we call an identity provider. And then they get redirected to Google, which plays the role of the relying party. And that's how you log in. And again, if you have um, a user like that, client login doesn't work for them because they actually log in at Yahoo and not at Google. And there's no programmatic equivalent of this sort of login dance that OpenID uses. Here's another example. When we uh, make acquisitions like YouTube or something like that, we try to uh, harmonize the account system so that users can log in to these new services on the Google login page. But sometimes there's sort of some extra setup steps needed to make sure that the user can use this, this new service. This happened, for example, with uh, YouTube. And I, I think on the first slide, I had a little screenshot of, of, a, of a blog post that shared the same name as the session. The YouTube team actually blogged about this a couple of months ago. Um, so again, if you're logging in on the web page, all that's necessary is you, you, know, you answer a couple more questions, you get taken through with this additional steps to, to sign in, and you're good to go. But if you were to connect to client login, it would just say, oh, you can't log into the service. This account is not in the right state to log in for the service. And there's a bunch of other uh, examples where this doesn't work. I mentioned that Google is a relying party to uh, Yahoo, AOL, and Hotmail, meaning that users type their password actually on those sites, and then they get redirected to Google log in there. We are also relying parties to thousands and thousands of other identity providers. And this is in the Google Apps uh, world, in the enterprise world and, and universities. So there, uh, an enterprise or university uh, runs their own login server. And users go there, log in over there, type their password over there, and then they get redirected. The protocol used there is SAML, which is a, different, a little different from OpenID, but it's basically the, uh, the same idea. And in this case, we don't, Google doesn't even have the passwords for those users. So client login couldn't possibly work. 
A uh, couple more examples. Uh, other account wizards for, for example, hijacked accounts. Uh, if, you, if a user comes to Google and they type the username and password, and we have seen some suspicious activity from the account that might indicate, again, that the account maybe has been taken over by a, by a hacker, we may suspend your account, and instead of logging into Google, we might say, hey, you know, answer a few more questions uh, to make sure that you're really you and not the attacker that hijacked your account. And that we call that a recovery flow. And again, that recovery flow exists on the web, no programmatic equivalent for it um, on the client login endpoint. And we may decide in the future to add more speed bumps to the login process. We might say, well, if you're logging in from, a, from an unusual IP address for this account or from an unusual country from this, from this account, we might ask you a few more questions before we uh, log you in to, to Google. And we might actually change and adjust what those speed bumps are. On the web, this is really easy to do. We just change the web pages we serve after, after the login page. But in the programmatic world, it's hard to do if you have clients out there that don't know that Google might be throwing new speed bumps at them during, during login. So all those things don't, don't work in, in client login. So let me show you a demo of uh, what it looks like if you are a user for which client login doesn't work, but you can log in on the web just fine. So this is the Google homepage. Nobody's logged in right now. I click on login. And I type uh, a user name that uh, ends in at yahoo.com. This is one of those open ID users. I don't have to type my password here. If I say sign in, I get redirected to Yahoo. Um, and I type my password over here. And now I'm logged into Google. And I can use Google services like Calendar and Picasa Web and so forth. OK. And let me also show you, I think, at this point, I also want to show you what happens if one of those users tries to use client login. Where's my cheat sheet? Right here. So if I take the same user and I try to hit the client login endpoint, there's, this, there's the same account name here. I just get an error back. So I can log in on the web, but I can't use client login. All right. So we've seen a bunch of examples where client login fails. So one of the th sort of workarounds that we have are these things we, we call application-specific passwords. An application-specific password is a computer-generated password. Google will generate it for the user. That works just like a password. In particular, you can use it on the client login endpoint, but you can have many of them. They're, they're labeled. The user names them when they, when they ask Google to create new ones. And you can revoke them. And those are useful for clients that, for whatever reason, can't really move away from, from client login or other protocols that use username and password-based authentication. So if you have an IMAP client, uh, a chat client, talk client, uh, old Android devices that aren't upgraded to the latest version, exchange clients, and so forth, users can go to, this, uh, to a page that is linked from their accounts page, from their account overview page, and they can ask, Google to generate one of those application-specific passwords for them. And then you take that password and you type it in the password field of you know, wherever the application asks for a password. So that sounds pretty good. And it works with legacy clients for many of the use cases that I mentioned earlier. It works for users that have signed up for two-step verification. It works for OpenID users. Um, it could work for SAML users if the enterprise admin has switched it on. But it does provide a pretty bad user experience, especially if it's on some device, if I want to configure the Exchange client on my iPhone or something. I probably need to walk up to another to my desktop and log in, go to the accounts page, go to the application-specific passwords page, generate one of those passwords, copy it over. It's, it's not that great. And some of those use cases that I talked about actually still don't work even with application-specific passwords. If your account is suspended because of some hijacking suspicion, it's suspended. And you have to go through a web flow to, to rec recover your password. If, if it's one of those um, setup situations where the account is to be set up for, for YouTube or something, uh, you have to do that on the web. And, and your application-specific password just won't work. 
So really, the message is when client login fails, just stop using client login. Just don't, don't do it. And what you're supposed to use instead is OAuth. And you, you may have heard that OAuth is used, or probably know that your OAuth is used a lot on the web for uh, connecting what are also called relying parties to service providers. But it does also work for installed applications. And in fact, you don't even need a web browser. And I'll, I'll demo that in a moment. The idea is basically in OAuth that instead of asking the user to type in their username and password directly into the application, you use a, a web browser. You either launch the web browser that's available on the platform and ask the user to um, complete the OAuth flow in that browser, or you, um, you frame a web view. Those are available on, on all platforms that I know of. And you take the user through the OAuth flow in that, in that web view. So in that, in that browser, the user authenticates. They may, have, they may get redirected to Yahoo or wherever. They may be asked for their second factor. They may be asked for a captcha. They may be asked for all sorts of things. But at some point, they're going to be logged in. And then they see this OAuth approval screen where they're being uh, told what kind of privileges they're giving to the installed application. And then the user has a chance to click on Allow Access. And then the installed app ends up with the, with the OAuth token. And those OAuth tokens are really easy to use. In OAuth 2, uh, there's no more signatures, no more crypto. It's really all quite easy. Uh, you stick them even in the same place that client login tokens uh, used to go. It's in the authorization header. Um, put the token right there. You can use that to access the uh, Google API endpoints. The only difference is that client login tokens are typically valid for about two weeks or so. OAuth tokens are valid for about an hour. So the two-week time frame typically means that when the user interacts with your application, they are done interacting with your application before that token expires. But the one-hour expiration time is not so sure. So what you need to do is actually get a fresh OAuth token when the OAuth token stops working. So what happens is that out of the OAuth flow, you end up with two tokens. There's a refresh token that doesn't expire, lasts forever until the user revokes it, but cannot be used to access API endpoints. And then there's the access token. That's the thing that you take to the OAuth endpoint uh, in lieu of the client login token. And that, that's the thing that expires after an hour. So you need to. Uh, write your code such that if, if and when the access token stops working, you use the refresh token to help yourself to a new access token, and then you use that. That's the only difference, really, to, to client login. And we have explained this in our uh, developer documentation. If you search for OAuth to Google, you get to a page that not only explains OAuth 2 in general, but in particular sort of customizes it for the Google endpoints that we use for, for OAuth 2. The next two slides I have just show you what the UI typically, typically looks like to the user when an application uses OAuth instead of client login. So just as a reminder, on the web, if you have a relying party, it's a web app that, say, wants to get access to some parts of the account that the user has at Google, for example, the address book, then what the, the, the relying party the web app does, it says, hey, I'm one, you know, I would really like to have access to your address book because I want to help you manage your address book, for example. Um, so click here if you want to set up that functionality. User clicks there. They get redirected to Google. They, say a, they, they see a screen like, like this one uh, on the slide right now. And then chances are they're already logged in because you know, they're Google users and they're logged in. So they immediately see this page right here. And then they click on Allow Access. And then Google redirects back to that relying party with the OAuth token in the redirect URL. And that's how the relying party ends up with the OAuth token. So what does it look like for installed applications? Here's a screenshot from an app that we uh, ship to our enterprise customers. Uh, and it runs on Windows. And you can see it really doesn't look that much different. On the left, there is uh, a native window on Microsoft Windows where we explain to the user, you know, if you click here, we're going to launch the browser. To, to set up this application. And then the next thing the user knows is that they're staring at the normal browser, at the normal OAuth window. They're probably already logged in. So the next thing they see is this approval screen. They say, allow access. And then the native application uh, puts itself back in the foreground and 
consumes the OAuth token and, and takes it from there. So we wrote a little library that we use internally, give, give to our teams that write uh, native apps for Windows, and we're in the process of sort of cleaning it up a little bit so that it's uh, suitable for public consumption. And so hopefully we'll be able to release this open source soon so you guys uh, have some help with this kind of flow. Next screenshot is from iOS. There we actually have a library available right now that you can go and download a few slides from now. I'll have a, I have a link that points to the library. It looks very similar. I don't actually have the shot of the app launching the process. I guess that would be sort of the, the, the picture on the left to the first uh, phone here. But similar idea. You have an app that says, hey, I'd like, you know, have access to your address book, click here, user clicks there. Next thing they see is the, a web view that takes them through the OAuth flow. So in this case, the user has to log in. And then after they log in, they see the OAuth approval page. They say allow access. And then at that point, the native app that is uh, framing the web view in this case, which is close the web view, uh, would help itself to the token and would, would take it from there. And I actually have a demo of that uh, that uses a different library. And on the iPad, let me try and switch it over and show you how that works. I brought my iPad. Can you guys see that? OK, great. And I have an app on here that you probably have heard about. It's called Flipboard. And um, Flipboard is an, is an app that sort of curates interesting news items by connecting to various accounts that I might, might have, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. And one of the accounts you can add is a Google Reader account. So let me show you how that works. Add an account, Google Reader. And you can see it's a web view. I'm being, reader, I'm being redirected to Google. Let's log, as one of, let's log in as one of those users for which client login doesn't actually work. Um, So that redirects me to Yahoo. Okay. So I log in. This is the approval screen. This, these guys actually use our OAuth 1 version of the OAuth flow. It's actually a little bit more complicated because in OAuth 1, there's still crypto involved and so forth. And the approval screen is uh, not quite as pretty. Uh, but they have been um, having this in place for a while since before we launched OAuth 2. So you, you guys probably want to skip the whole OAuth 1 um, version of this and uh, skip straight, straight to OAuth 2. Uh, but the concept is really exactly the same. When I say grant access here, um, I get this new uh, section in Flipboard that has, is now connected to my Google Reader account. And this worked for an account for which client login uh, is not functional. OK, let's get back to the slides. So you might have noticed that sometimes I used an external browser. When I showed you the screenshots of the Windows version, there was an external browser that was launched. And sometimes we use web views on the, the iOS examples, both the screenshots I had of Google's own library as well as the Flipboard example used, used web views. So when, when should you use which external browser versus web view? So I talked to a, a bunch of developers at Google about this, and I got sort of sometimes conflicting opinions on this. And I tried to sort of synthesize what I learned into a set of three rules. And I'm not sure this is necessarily the final word on, on this question. I'm actually also curious if you guys have tried this and have come down one way or another. I'm interested um, in hearing you guys' opinion on this. But from the experience that I have gained sort of vicariously by talking to developers, this is the um, set of rules that I came up with. Rule number one, use an external browser. 
like we did in that screenshot from the Windows application. And the main advantage of using an external browser is that very, very likely your users already logged in and they don't have to go through the login process typing their password, perhaps typing their OTP, perhaps you know, when they get redirected to Yahoo, you might have noticed I had to type my username twice, once into Google and once into Yahoo because OpenID just isn't quite convenient enough to carry that over from one site to the other. So all those inconveniences go away, and the user's very likely already logged in, and they just have a one-click sort of approval um, experience at this point. And there's other benefits, too. Uh, the password is not typed directly into the application. Uh, on the web, we certainly do frown upon it uh, quite a bit if an application, a web app, is asking for your Google username and password. Um, there it's considered really bad practice. On, for installed applications, this is a little more common, but really, if you can avoid it, it's just sort of nice security hygiene uh, not to do that. You could also imagine that maybe you're in an enterprise setting and the users use some sort of plugin that uses Kerberos or whatnot to authenticate to their um, login server. And those plugins tend to work in standalone browsers, but not in web views. Or more simply, if you just uh, think of password managers that users use to autofill their username and password, those tend to work in standalone browsers, but not in web views. Also imagine, I talked earlier a little bit about these speed bumps that service providers sometimes choose to throw into the login process when something looks unusual. And one of the, one of the things that they might do is use risk-based sort of authentication where they look at certain signals from, from the client. And those might look different if you're using a um, standalone browser versus a web view. So if you choose to use a web view, you might make it more likely for your users to go through extra uh, speed bumps. So that's rule number one, use an external browser. Rule number two, if that doesn't work, use a web view. Why might it not work? So for example, on iOS, if you launch an external browser, your application gets put to sleep. And you don't really get a guarantee that it's ever woken up again. The user, um, in addition, there's no back button right, on, on, on iOS. Um, if the user decides that oh, they didn't really want to go there, they want to go back, there's no good way to, to go back to, to, the, to the native application. Because your application is put to sleep, the way it gets woken up is by it registering a, a URL and handling that URL. But there's no guarantee that there isn't some other app that also registered the same callback URL. So maybe some other app will end up, end up with your OAuth tokens. So on iOS, we therefore often see solutions with a iframe, a iframe where they frame the, the web view and do it inside a web view. And the price you pay is that you're very likely, as a user, to have to type in your username and password because the cookie jar is separate in, in your application from the cookie jar that the, that the standalone browser uses on the, on, the, on the platform. And then rule number three is sometimes use a web view anyway. If you know that all those advantages that I uh, have listed here under rule number one certainly don't apply to your use case, then it's OK to use a web view. One example of this is the, uh, the Android team does this in their out-of-box experience. When you buy a new phone or tablet and you unpack the box, you, you, know, you turn it on for the first time, one of the things you do there in the beginning is you uh, provision your account. You type your username and password. And at that point, you know that the user has never used a standalone browser on this platform to log in. There's no chance that any of these advantages from rule number one could possibly kick in. So you might as well use a web view in this case. OK, so this is sort of my synthesized uh, rules of, of when to use a web view, when to use an, an, an embedded browser. So the next two slides I have are about sort of hands-on, I guess, um, recommendations on how to do this, how to implement this for installed applications. And first, I'm going to talk about desktop, uh, pl uh, desktop platforms, Windows, OS X. And there we found a trick that works sort of across a variety of platforms, Linux, uh, OS X, Windows, pretty much the same way on all the platforms. And what we do is we scrape the OAuth token from a, from a window title. When you go and register your native application with the APIs console at Google, 
you say this is a native application, you get a client ID, client secret, and you're being told that your redirect URL is this funny earn, this funny string here, earn IETF, blah, blah, blah. And then so you put that redirect URL during the OAuth flow as your redirect URL. And when we see that particular redirect URL, when the user sees the approvals page and says allow access, instead of redirecting back to some web app that sits out there, which we don't have in this case, we actually redirect to a page at Google. And what that page does, it puts the OAuth token in the title bar of the browser. And then the native application, the installed application, can sit in the background and just look through all the windows that are open on the desktop and look for one of the windows that has that um, string in the title bar and scrape it out of there. Let me show you how that works. Takes a couple seconds here for the uh, screen to come back up. Okay. Where's my cheat sheet? All right, so I went and registered uh, with the, the APIs console, I got a client ID and a client secret, which you see here. And then what I'll do next is I'll just launch a web browser, the web browser that is native to the, to the platform. And I pointed to the OAuth2 endpoint. It said accounts at google.com slash oauth 2 auth I have to say what my client ID is, and I have to say what my redirect URI is, and it's this funny urn that I mentioned a moment ago. And I say what API I want access to. And again, this is the address book API. So when I do that, the a browser gets launched. Again, I'm already logged in, which is very likely what's happening to your users also. And notice how I'm this user that actually, for which client login doesn't work. And when I say allow access, I am now at a page that has basically the token on the page, but also it put it right here in the title of the browser. And you could write your application in a way, and it's not showing me, anyway, you can kind of see it. You could write your application in a way that says, you know, go through the OAuth flow, and when you get to the page with the funny random stuff on it, copy that and paste it into the, into, into the application. Or you could write your application such that it sits in the background and looks for this event to happen. And just to show you how that might work, I put a little bit of code together here that I prepared. Um, we're going to try and scrape that token off that title bar now. Um, importing a bunch of this is really all pretty standard stuff. The only thing I had to actually go and download is this AppScript Python library, which is just a little bit of glue between Python and AppleScript. In the real world, you probably wouldn't use AppleScript for, for this demo. It's, um, it was pretty easy to get going. And then I'll uh, make myself just a few very simple functions here. The first one is a function that, given one of those AppleScript process, objects returns a list of all the windows that belong to that process. And since that method might throw, I'm catching that and returning the empty list so it's safe to ask any process object out there what its list of windows are. The next function here is given a list of window titles, list of strings. It uses regular expression matching to see whether one of those looks like it might have one of those OAuth thingies in it, and if so, extracts it and returns it. And then the last little function here that I have is the one that does the actual work. It uses this app script layer, glue layer to add to the Apple script engine to connect to an app called System Events. And that app is one I can ask for a list of all the running processes on the system. And then I ask each of these processes for a list of windows that belong to the process. Now I have a list of lists, so I need to sort of flatten that down. That's what this line does. Now I have a list of windows, and then I extract the code from that list of windows. And so when I call that function, hopefully we now just screen scrape that, that code of the, of the title bar. And that is actually not quite our OAuth token yet. This is just a one-time use code that you need to exchange for your OAuth token. And again, there's a little method that, uh, function that shows you how to do this. Again, we're using curl just to hit this particular endpoint. It's on accounts, google.com, OAuth token. You put your uh, client ID, your client secret, and this token we just scraped. Where did I put it? Right here. 
and that returns a little bit of JSON that has the refresh token, this long-lived token, the access token, which will expire in an hour in it. And we're right now only interested in the access token, so I'm peeling that out, uh, out, of the, uh, out of the response. So let's call that method. And there's our access token. So you would probably do that sitting in the background, trying to scrape the token off your, off your browser. So now let's see whether we can hit an API with that, with that token. And there you go. Actually, let me see. And I have somewhere, right, this thing that filters out, filters to all the, there you go. So that's the address book of this guy that couldn't use client login. We started off with an example of, a, of an account that was using client login. So that's the trick that we found to work pretty well across different platforms. Other um, um, practices that are sometimes recommended are to you to run a little web server inside your installed application and then use as the redirect URI something that says HTTP localhost, localhost colon port. We found that to be a little unreliable, especially on Windows. There's often firewalls running that at the very least throw up some confusing screens that users don't quite know what to deal with that warn them or perhaps sometimes even forbid it altogether. Another practice that is sometimes recommended is to use a custom scheme. So as you redirect your eye, you say something, something, foobar, colon, slash, slash, redirect, or something like that. And again, it's a little uh, unreliable to use this, this practice because you don't know that there isn't another app that registered the same redirect, and now that app on the platform gets your token instead of, instead of your app. Okay, so that's the how to do it on, on a desktop platform. On iOS, I mentioned earlier that we have a library that you can download. There's the link where you can go. There's an OAuth 1 version of this that comes actually with our GData Objective-C library. But now we all have an OAuth 2 version also available. That's standalone, that's available at this, at this URL. This library uses a, a web view, unlike what I just demoed where I popped up the, the standalone browser. And the trick it uses there to get to the OAuth token is that because the application hosts the web view, you can register callbacks every time the URL changes that the web view is asked to go visit. So there you just you intercept at that moment when after the user hits allow, the server serves a 302 to the redirect URI with that token in the, in the URL. So at that point, the application can just intercept it, grab the token out of the URL, and, and take it from there. I mentioned earlier that using a web view is sort of necessary in iOS because of some usability issues, but you pay the price by virtually guarantee, guaranteeing that the user has to type the username and password. So one of the projects I'm currently working on is to try to get rid of, that, of the necessity for the user to type the username and password and to use uh, an inst another installed application on the phone, the Google Mobile app, as sort of an account manager, which would store probably in Keychain or something like that uh, the credentials for the user, and so the user wouldn't have to type them. And so hopefully we'll, we'll have something like that in the future. Okay, I haven't talked about Android much today, and the reason I haven't talked about Android is because an Android things work a little differently. I, I did mention how one of the things you do when you, when you use an Android device in the very beginning is you provision Google accounts with it. It's part of sort of the out-of-box experience. And then the phone stores, not the password, but sort of the moral equivalent of a password for the user. And as a result, users are really not used to ep applications ever asking them for their Google username and password. Instead, what applications do on Android is they can ask the operating system, say, dear operating system, I need an auth token. And then the operating system just provides. And the application, then, and what the oper operating system provides in this case is a client login token. And in particular, the, the, uh, the, the component that you, use, that you ask for the password is called the account manager. And today, when the application asks for such a token, the thing that you get back is a client login token. And that's okay, 
the problem with client login tokens is not so much that you can't use them with Google APIs. The problem with client login is that you can't get the client login tokens for a large class of users. But on Android, uh, we made it so that even for the kinds of users for which client login per se doesn't work, you can still ask for client login tokens, and the OS will still give them to you, even for a two-step verification user, even for an OpenID user. So on Android, the, the need to move away from client login is a little less pressing, because the OS uh, can do magic, essentially, and can give you client login tokens. Having said that, we are working on OAuth 2 support on Android, where the application can say, hey, OS, I would like not a client login token, but an OAuth token. And then the OS provides, just like it does today with the client login tokens. The screenshot I have on here on the slide is actually for, for the sort of the client login version of what this looks like. And it, it typically happens like this. The application calls, and calls the account manager, which is part of the OS, and says, hey, give me a list of all the Google accounts that are provisioned on the phone. Then the account manager returns the list, and the app then displays that list for the user to choose which account they would like to use at this point in time. User picks one, and then the app goes back to the account manager and says, OK, now I would like a token for, for this account that the user just picked. And at this point, context switches to the account manager. You can see that the look and feel is quite different. The account manager shows the approval screen. And if and when the user approves, hands the token back to the application, which then over here is happy and goes ahead with uh, using that, that token. And in OAuth 2, this is likely going to look very, very similar. The account manager just does it for the application. The application doesn't have to worry about any of the stuff. OK, next thing I want to talk about is the device flow. I mentioned very early on that sometimes you don't even need an, a web browser. And this also works for devices that have bad uh, user input uh, methods or maybe no user inputs of, uh, methods available. Think a picture frame or something like that. So what happens there is that uh, OAuth provides a, what, what we call a device flow where the native application that runs, let's say, on a picture frame contacts Google. It gets a user, and what do we call activation code, an activation code and a device code. It displays, the, it displays the activation code to the user and says, hey, why don't you go to Google, to this certain page at Google, type in this activation code, and once you approve access, you know, the application that's running on the device will have access to whatever account the user is using at Google. Let me show you how that works. I also have a, a little code snippet for that. Device flow. So the device would go, the application that's running on the device would go to this particular URL. Currently, we're running this still on Sandbox, so this isn't like launched in production, but it's available for testing. Contact the Sandbox at Google, where it gets back a little bit of data that has the user code in it that you would display to the user and say, hey, take this user code and enter it at Google. It has a device code, which we're going to use to uh, poll in the background and ask Google, hey, has the user approved yet? Has the user approved yet? Has the user approved yet? And it has also the URL that the user should go to. So let's pull out the device code out of this, because we use it to poll. And let's see whether the user has approved yet. Well, no, they haven't. But let's now assume that we're maybe on a different device. I walk over to the PC in the corner or on, on, my, on my tablet or what have you, and I go to this URL. I enter the, the, user, the activation code that the device hopefully displays to the user. Oh, where am I? And after I do that, I see again the OAuth approval screen. I say, allow access. And then you see why this is not launched in production yet. It's still <laughs> um, sort of in testing mode. But anyway, so now if we try the same call again, we actually do get back a result from the server that says, yes, approval has been granted. Here's your refresh token. Here's your access token. And we would take it from there, just like we did 
when we scrape that, that code from the, from the window title. So that's the device flow. It's ready for testing. There's an email address on the screen that you can email if you maybe want to get, stay in touch with us and know when this launches for real. We just have questions about it. I'm not even sure that we have like, the documentation up publicly. So if you email that, maybe someone will just send you uh, an explanation how to use it. All right. So I think I have like maybe two slides left or so. OAuth for XMPP, IMAP, POP, SMTP. So far, I've talked about uh, RESTful APIs that use the client login endpoint. There are other protocols that don't use client login, but that have the same uh, assumption built into them that the user authenticates with a username and a password. XMPP IMAP, in the protocol, it says this is where the username goes, this is where the password goes. And if you have a user account that doesn't use a password to authenticate to the server, those things break. We launched a while ago support for OAuth 1 in IMAP and SMTP. So what, as let's say, an IMAP client would do in this case, they would take the user through the OAuth flow. Out of the OAuth flow, in the OAuth 1 case, pops a, an access token and a, and a token secret. And then you use the secret to create the signed assertion of a bunch of different parameters. And you put that assertion where the password normally would go in XMPP or IMAP. And we're currently working on an OAuth 2 version of this, of this, which should be much easier. You just take the token, you put it where the password would go, and you, it should be really easy. We're also working on the same thing for XMPP, where we're skipping the OAuth 1 version of this. We're going to go straight to OAuth 2. And there's a standardized uh, way of doing this that is currently being hashed out in uh, a bunch of standardization committees. And when these guys get their act together, I assume we'll, we'll support whatever that standard is that, that is agreed upon there. OK, I think this is pretty much my last slide here. One thing that it's a couple of sort of thoughts in, in parting is that installed applications can't keep secrets. When you go to the API's console and you register your app with Google and you say, this is an installed application, you get a client ID and you get a client secret, that secret isn't really secret. Anyone who downloads your application can reverse engineer your application and can find out what that secret is. So don't treat the secret as if it were a secret. We certainly on a server side don't. We have other uh, mechanisms in place that sort of look out for behavior that is either malicious or benign just based on the client ID. Never, ever, ever use the same client ID in secret for a native app and a web app. For web apps, those secrets actually can stay secret, and we use them to authenticate, to strongly authenticate uh, OAuth clients. And the last thing I want to mention that the scopes that you use to identify the service you want to talk to in, in OAuth are somewhat more, there's more of them than we used to have for client login. Some of our teams now have sort of fine-grained scope, maybe a read-only scope and a read-write scope and so forth. So it's easier to ask just for the privileges that you need for your application instead of asking for too much. All right, so to summarize, I started off explaining a bunch of different use cases in which client login fails for a class of users. One of the classes of users I mentioned was OpenID. Today, when a user that has an at yahoo.com email address uh, uses that for their Google account, they can opt in to using OpenID. We may in the future decide that this is such a great experience not to have to have yet another password for Google for the Yahoo users that we just switch it on for all of them. And same with AOL and Hotmail. And if and when we decide to do that, like a large fraction of Google users will just no longer be able to use client login. That's something to keep in mind if you're using client login currently. And then I mentioned other use cases in which client login also breaks. I talked a little bit about application-specific passwords, but they're really just a stopgap. And what you should be doing, and what I spent most of my time talking about, was OAuth 2 and how to use it from installed applications. To learn more, go to Ryan's session tomorrow. He'll talk a little bit more about OpenID and OAuth. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, search for OAuth to Google, and you'll get the page where we explain all of this in some detail. All right, and with that, I'm ready to take questions. Again, the feedback URL and the hashtags are on the slide. If you have questions, please use the microphone so they're being recorded. Anyone? 
Um, you recommended that uh, applications don't store any secrets. Um, what if uh, I'm building an application where the user would want the application to remember the password? You know, they install it, they type in the username and password once, they click a checkbox, and we never ask again. Right. Um, well, I wouldn't say that applications should never store a secret. And today, many applications store passwords, and I think that has certain advantages not to have to type the password every time I want to use the application. One thing that is nice about OAuth is that the secret, this refresh token that doesn't expire, that secret that you could choose to store, I think that's fine, is actually finer scoped than the password would have been. So the secrets that you end up storing isn't quite as powerful as the password would have been. And it's also revocable. If something goes wrong, the user realizes, oh, this application is sort of abusive. They can go and revoke the token. So I think it's fine to store a refresh token, uh, for example, in the keychain. Use, you know, use good tools that you have on the platform. Uh, protected uh, data protection API, keychain, and so forth. But I think it's okay to, to put them there, the, the, the refresh tokens. Okay. Okay. Everybody wants to go play with their new Galaxy tabs? All right, well, thank you.